All right. B. All right. The four strokes slash five events. And the four strokes are? Intake, compression, power, and exhaust. Yes, so we start with intake. I like to start with intake because it seems like the logical place to start. And the piston for intake is where when it starts? So the piston is on top, dead center. And the intake valve has to open. There are two valves, the intake valve and the exhaust valve. So the intake valve opens. Um, and when does the intake stroke stop? It ends on bottom dead center. I shouldn't say intake valve opens. I should say it's intake valve is open in the way I'm writing this. All right, we have compression. The compression stroke starts starts on bottom dead center, right where we left off, thankfully enough. Uh, valves, both valves are closed. Now, I, I need to preface this. I should have already said this. What we're doing right now is looking at an overly simplified version of the four-stroke, auto four-stroke. The animation is an overly simplified version of it. We'll clean this up in a minute, but it's just easier to start with a simplified version than it is to start with what really happens. All right, um, compression starts on bottom dead center. Both valves are obviously closed. Piston's coming up. What, ha what else happens during the compression stroke? Ignition. The ignition. Spark plug fires. What fires a spark plug in an aircraft engine? Magneto. Magneto. And it ends where? Top dead center. Ends on top dead center. And the very next stroke to happen is then going to be the power stroke. The power stroke. Well, it's going to start where? Starts on TDC, which is convenient since that's where we just left off. Uh, what about the valves? Both closed, so both valves closed. Um, where does it end? Oops, ends on bottom dead center. Um, all right, a couple side notes on here. Um, the pressure in the cylinder is greatest just after top dead center. Mm -hmm. So that piston's going to come up. On the compression, while it's coming up, the spark plug fires. It continues to come up. Then it's going to start coming down. It's just a little bit after top dead center. Whoosh, that's where the pressure is the greatest. Uh, let's see. Most of your gases, most gases, are burned up um, by about... 14 degrees um, ATDC. What does ATDC mean? What is the A? After, after, after top dead center. So we have just a little bit, I don't have the degrees, but a couple degrees after top dead center. It's our greatest cylinder pressure. And then a little bit further, all the gas is already burned up and then the piston's moving down. Uh, and then our last stroke, exhaust. exhaust. which starts at bottom dead center. Good thing because that's where we left off. Um, exhaust valve is open. And 
and ends on and what happens next the intake starts so that's going to start all over again um, some point I really wanted to make there and I'm like, oh, I really oh I, um, when you get into the next four weeks with Phil and you start talking about the Brayton cycle the Brayton cycle is considered they're considered constant pressure engines as opposed to a piston engine which is not a constant pressure engine and the theory being well the not theory it just is if I put a pressure gauge in a cylinder started the engine up what would the pressure gauge read <laughs> it goes all the way from suction to you know a couple hundred psi so it's just it's all over the place but if you take a turbine engine and you drill in there and you put a pressure gauge it'll be dead rock steady depending on where you put it so and it's always in that one area it's just that area is steady so that's why it's a constant pressure it's not constant through the whole engine but every spot it's always constant as where this is not um, let's see I recognize some of the new things that I wrote in my notes. And I think, why would I write that? I know I'd write it because it's a Q&A question. What is engine flexibility? The ability of an engine to run smoothly and give the desired performance at all speeds. To run smoothly. and to give the desired performance at all speeds. That, to me, that's a funny statement because when you consider the difference between an aircraft engine and a car engine, the differences are pretty astonishing from an operation standpoint. When you think about your car engine, it runs very smoothly and easy and effortlessly without you thinking much about it all the way from idle to wide open throttle. However, a hundred thousand dollar aircraft engine must be babied and coaxed along, as soon as I coaxed along, it must be babied and monitored every second of its operation. So you start off with it in idle. First of all, aircraft engines are enormously difficult to get started, especially fuel injected engines. They're just, don't ever laugh at somebody who's got a fuel injected engine and they're cranking and cranking and cranking. It won't start like, ah, dummy doesn't even start his engine. No, they're just that hard to get started. Sometimes it's just a hope and a prayer to get them going. Um, carbureted engines, much easier to get started. Um, so once it's started, the first thing you have to realize is that you're running it way too freaking rich and you'd better pull the mixture all the way, practically all the way out and kill off some of the fuel because it's running too rich. And our fuel has excessive amounts of lead in it to keep the octane rating high. We'll talk about that later. So lead is very bad for engines, but we have it. They give it to us in massive quantities. So we need to back off the fuel to keep the lead contamination from a minimum. Then you have to remember to enrich in it when you take off and you have to advance throttle slowly. You can't jam in the throttle because that can detune an engine and damage the propeller. Um, but the stark difference is if you were to take your car engine and you were, I don't know where, uh, I-5 in the middle of the night and you were to mash the pedal all the way down to the floor and just hold it there, I don't know if your engine would last very long. And, huh? was not designed to do that. I have no idea what it would do, how long it could do that, but you can't do that. I, on the other hand, can mash, every aircraft engine out there has been designed to be started up, go to wide open throttle and run its entire life at wide open throttle. So if it's a 2000 hour TBO, it's designed to run 2000 hours at wide open throttle with no brake. So that's a huge difference right there. So when you talk about flexibility, it's like, well, uh, 
Car engines, the timing, engine, ignition timing varies all across the board. Not across the board, but they have a wide range. We don't have variable timing, really, in our aircraft engines. Eh, they're getting that way, but for the most part, timing's just set. Boom. And it doesn't really like it. To, you know, you know magnetos. you got to have an impulse coupling to get it started. And the impulse coupling has to disengage because one thing for starting, one thing for running. So, um, Rotax engines have this thing called a soft start. It's really weird. It's electronic ignition that's timed to retard the throttle as you're starting it. And once it starts, give it a few seconds, all of a sudden it changes pitch. Well, what happened is it went from the start function to the run function, and the timing just went from here to here. Boom. That's so like, uh, it kind of shakes and rattles, and boom, then suddenly it's running smooth. I'm like, what the hell was that about? Yeah. Is that similar to a fade or no? Yeah, I would call it that, yeah. Okay. FADAC, full authority, automated engine controls, something like that. So it's like, most of our aircraft engines don't have FADAC. You manually do everything, but a FADAC controlled aircraft has one throttle lever which will control everything. All right, efficiency. Well, just how efficient are engines in general? This goes for aircraft as well as automotive. We can talk about thermal efficiency. I would say they're rather efficient at wasting energy, if you want to be true. All right. So first we've got to talk about heat work. Heat work. How is work expressed in heat? Joules. Um, that would be electricity, actually. Well, maybe you could use joules, but joules is a function of coulombs versus... Bombs, so. <laughs> <laughs> Too much information. Exactly That's, the same. Uh, it is BTUs, the British thermal unit. Also known as the BTU. The BTU is, how much is a BTU? And you might think this is trivia, but this was actually a question that I had to ask as a mechanic examiner. It is one of the oral questions. I don't know if it still is, but... It was, what is a BTU? And that was the question. A BTU is? British thermal unit. Define it. The way heat is expressed. The amount of energy it takes to cook a bread. A crumpet. Like the amount of energy required <laughs> to boil. Of come on, here's coming. gallon of water. Uh, is it at sea level? Ah, he's pretty close there. The amount of heat required. to raise one pound, one pound, one, one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. 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 Also known as 778 foot pounds of work. That number is going to come in handy for us here. Well, not handy, but you're going to see it again. Uh, <laughs> foot pounds of work. One pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. Remember, they thought of this a long time ago, so it's before, before the Celsius. Is great. Uh, let's see. All right. This is going to get off in the weeds a little bit. So one pound of petroleum. One, oops, one LB. One pound of petroleum. Petroleum. And this is something you want to commit to memory in aviation that is... For aviation gasoline, not um, jet A, all fuels, it is six. That's the number six pounds, pounds per gallon. Does that say 778 pounds? Yes, it does. Six pounds per gallon, so one, number one pound, is how many gallons? Six. One six gallon. One six gallon can produce about twenty thousand BTU, or fifteen five six zero 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 foot pounds of work. which was 778 times 20,000.
which is where I got that number. That's a whole lot of work. One pound of petroleum can produce. However, what happens to all this? So thermal efficiency is the percent of work is the percent of work an engine gets for that pound of fuel. So how many foot pounds should we get out of this? A lot. 15 million, 560,000. Is that about how much uh, foot pounds of torque you're getting out of your car? Probably not. <laughs> All right. 20 to 30 percent of this fuel, this heat energy, is used for power output. Fifteen to twenty percent is lost through um, heat radiated from cylinders. Uh, five to ten percent um, is lost in friction. gears meshing together, uh, pistons sliding in cylinders, uh, things going around in bearings. And that leaves 40 to 50% out of the exhaust. Which is kind of a funny thing to think about. Wouldn't that mean that if an engine was 100% efficient in turning the fuel into work, that it would run cold? Yes. Because all of the heat energy would be going into pushing the piston, which would mean there's no other heat radiated anywhere. It would expend all of the heat energy pushing that push piston out. So you'd put your hand on like, wow, it's cold and all that power. And you'd go up to the exhaust and the exhaust would also be cold. You probably wouldn't need more than drop of fuel too. <laughs> yeah, you get all that out of it. So they don't want us to have that. Yeah. <laughs> the power's really fast. Who is they? Sir, we are they. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, One simple trait that mechanics don't want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> this is it, man. I know how to make a water car. Thermal efficiency can be computed, can be computed as follows. Let me see. Probably something I should have pulled out, but I didn't. Um, so indicated thermal efficiency. So the indicated, indicated thermal efficiency. Uh, equals um, indicated horsepower, indicated horsepower, HP. Um, so that would be IHP, IHP is what that stands for, times 33,000, a constant, divided by weight of fuel burned, weight of fuel burned, divided by Oh, per minute, per minute, per minute. That's what I meant to say. Not that. Weight of fuel burn per minute uh, times its heat value times 778. So, which is to say, if, if the horsepower or the IHP equals 85 horsepower, indicated horsepower. We'll talk about indicated versus other stuff. Indicated is like your theoretical. So 85 horsepower, and it uses 50 pounds of fuel, fuel per hour. And 
and our gasoline, uh, aviation gasoline had a um, heat value of 18,800 BTU per pound. Um, why am I doing this to you? I'm going to write down. Maybe just, maybe no. <laughs> Weight of fuel burned per minute, for the other 50 pounds an hour? Yep. Oh, uh, weight of fuel burned um, per minute, per minute equals uh, 50 divided by 60, which is 0.833. So that is 85 times 33 thousand divided by 0.833 times 18,800. Yeah, I'm not going to do this next year. Um, times 778 equals, all oh, that equals 0.23. So thermal efficiency is 0.23, which is also what percent? 23%. 23%. Not very good. I think that's an actual example that I actually, yes, it is. And then I wanted to know what the thermal efficiency of my aircraft engine is. So I'll just abbreviate this. So I have a I have an 0470U in my aircraft at 10,000 feet altitude, it burns 11 gallons per hour, which is how many pounds? 66, 66 pounds, 66 pounds. Um, and that's at 64% horsepower out of 230. So I came up with, let's see, um, 0.64 times 230, which is what? What number did I figure out right there? That's, one, That's my horsepower. Uh, 230 uh, is max horsepower. So the, at 64% max horsepower, uh, you get 147.2. That is correct times my constant, 33,000, divided by the fuel, which is uh, 66 out of 60. 1.1. Okay. Times the BTU, 18, 18. times 778, which is a constant. So that gives me 147.2 uh, uh, times 33,000, divided by 1.1, right? Just times 18. 800 times 778 and all that equals 0 0.3019. Yep. Okay, so my engine is at what, what efficient? 30.19% 30 efficient. So set roughly 70% of the cost of my fuel is going losses. So what's 70% of $7? <laughs> Like 4.9. Huh? 4.9. Four, so I'm spending. Five bucks. So five, five bucks. bucks. So for every. So I spend $7 in fuel. $5 of that seven is thrown away. Just only buy $2 of fuel then. Then you'll be good. So takeaway is uh, the Recip engine. R E C I. Inefficient as hell. R E C I. Is inefficient as hell. Uh, Recip engines. Are only about uh, my note said about 34 percent efficient, and that's 20 to 30 percent. Yeah, so they're not very efficient. Can you uh, go back up to the formula? Is, is it IHP times 30 percent? Yeah. 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 Thousand divided by weight of fuel burn per minute. <clears throat> times the heat value, times 778. Does it get better with altitude, or is it not quite that? Uh, so what happens with altitude is that there's less, there's less uh, friction on the airframe, okay. but the propeller can twist and get a bigger bite. Okay. So that's going to give you some efficiency in miles per gallon, if you will. <coughs> but the engine doesn't get any more efficient. Certainly lean it out more and you use less fuel. But so you're not too rich or too 
Yeah. Uh, uh, that was it. So that was that was a real. At ten thousand feet, I'm eleven. About hmm, nine, ten, eleven gallons per hour. That was right out of the book, and <clears throat> so in my pilot operating handbook. I have schedules for what altitude you're going to be at. So I pulled this up for 10,000 feet. Now, if I go to 10,000 feet, and what I'll do is I'll actually lean it by the book, because my engine's a little weird. The 0470s are just that way. Um, we'll talk more about that later, about rich, lean, lean a peak, peak, rich a peak. Anyway, uh, the pilot operating handbook says to lean the engine until you notice roughness and then increase the... Uh, richness until it just moves out. Well, when I do that, in a, when you do that in any 470, pretty much you get two cylinders that are going to run right at their peak, two are running lean of peak, and two are rich of peak. So it's kind of a, a weird thing. 470s are just distribution is terrible in these engines. But uh, anyway, so I'll do it to that by the book, and then I'll look at the book and see what gallons per hour I should be running. And I have a gallons per hour meter, and they match exactly, which is really crazy. I'm like, wow, the, th the book works. So. All right, so I told you that when we're looking at the four-stroke, five-event engine, that it was overly simplified in the animation that we looked at and in the description we did, where we start at be helpful about just one. where everything is at top dead center, bottom dead center. So if we look, we get right to the bottom dead center, boom, exhaust valve closes. We get to top dead center, boom, got a spark. Bottom dead center, boom, exhaust valve opens, top dead center, boom, exhaust valve closes. So everything's happening exactly at top dead center, bottom dead center, nothing happens in between. That is not the way an engine operates. That is very, very inefficient operation. So things are gonna happen differently. We can start with the ignition timing. Ignition timing is going to happen on aircraft engines. When we look at the 290, it was 25 degrees before top dead center. Yeah. So that is 25 degrees of crankshaft rotation before top dead center. So that would be, you know, 90 is here. There's 45. So I don't think this will allow me to get it where it should be. But, okay, so it should have already fired there on its way up which is a little crazy because you think, well, wait a minute, you know, if it sparks there, isn't it going to push the piston the other way down? It doesn't. The f it sparks and the flame front starts to burn. Remember, it's not an explosion now. The flame front starts to burn. It burns slowly as compared to what the piston is doing. And by the time the piston comes up to top dead center and you have a little tiny space left, the flame is now burning and now it's starting to push down the piston. And then, then once the piston comes across the other side, now it's going to start pushing it down. And we already talked about all these gases are burnt up about 14%. And as it gets down to here, the gases have stopped pushing on the piston. Yeah. So if it, uh, if it ignited at exactly top dead center, then that flame front is going to be trying to chase that piston down pretty much? It's exactly it. Just chasing the piston. Very inefficient. So if you have a very inefficient and you're not using the heat to produce work, then what is the heat going to do? Something I really hadn't thought about until just now. Everything else has to get hotter. Yeah. I remember um, I had a, uh, almost embarrassing, I had a, uh, what was it, like a 1983 Z28. And uh, so the timing chain, that's the, between the camshaft and the crankshaft that has to be timed exactly right here, this crank and cam, that be timed so the valves are doing the right thing at the exact right time. And uh, uh, so my stepdad goes, oh man, this, in this kit came with a little tiny washer. We're gonna advance the cam by four degrees, which is, you can't even perceive it. It's just this little spacer that had a little tiny space on one end. And uh, we put this in the other, that'll really wake this car up. I tried to drive it home and overheated. You know, so I had to wait for it to cool down, drive back to the shop, like it overheats. Goes, oh man, you know, four degrees, it just, it overheated the whole thing. So uh, this timing stuff is kind of critical. And you're so far up there, it's so close to change. What's that? Are you not supposed to change your ignition timing either? 
Maybe that was it. I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing back then. I was following his orders. So, all right. Uh, so, volumetric efficiency. So, what we want to do with this is U M E T R I volumetric efficiency and valve overlap. Volumetric efficiency is a big deal in any engine. Uh, it's like a bigger deal in aircraft engines, mostly because that's what I work on and care about. <laughs> so, so the idea here is that, uh, let's see. All right, so the right way. So as this piston's coming down and this intake valve is open, hopefully you can all see that okay. Piston's coming down, the intake valve is open. It's going to get, and the piston's moving very fast. And so what is pulling the air in? At this point, that piston is nothing more than a syringe pulling back. And the atmospheric air is coming in. Well, it's got to go past a carburetor, which has restrictions, or a fuel injection system, which has restrictions. Um, you have intake pipes, tubes that have some restrictions. So this big syringe is pulling back, and it's pulling back fast, right? And so it's coming back very fast. And as it gets to the bottom, you would hope that you know as you pull back if you pull back a syringe when you're done pulling back the pressure inside is the same as the pressure out here right but in an aircraft or in any engine that doesn't happen so as soon as it gets to the bottom and that valve closed this pressure in the cylinder is a lot less than the pressure in the atmosphere well that's a bad bad thing because the whole goal of this was to get as much air and fuel into this space as we could. And so if the whole goal was to get as much air and fuel into this space, and this pressure out here in the atmosphere is more than in here, we failed. And that's, that's a bad thing, but that's the reality of this situation. Um, if this was at idle, idle is slow speed, it's at idle because we have a carburetor, and inside the carburetor where the air goes through, we have a butterfly valve that is, that's wide open, that's idle. And you have a very tiny little, I mean, really, it's almost, it's hard to see. You guys will see this in another class. How there's almost no air can, light can even go through. I'm like, well, how's the fuel getting through there? Well, it doesn't. And this is a gigantic vacuum here in this intake tube. It, it, it's a vacuum, um, just like a vacuum cleaner. So you have a big vacuum, uh, but even at wide open throttle, psh, we have a Venturi in there on most systems, and that's a restriction, and on and on. So we're not getting as much air in there as we should have, so we failed. That is called volumetric efficiency, how much air we managed to get into the cylinder um, as opposed to what we could have got. Everybody follow? So if I, in this engine right here, you know, if we're running it super fast, well, it's volumetric efficiency going to be low. But if I stopped the engine right there, it would have... 100% volumetric efficiency, because eventually if I stopped the engine, it turned off the engine, just left it there, and the piston's here, the valve's open, all the air from the outside will come in here and fill up the cylinder, and it would be equalized, equalized which is 100% efficiency. So all you need to do to get 100% efficiency is just stop your engine at this point every time, right? Okay, so volumetric efficiency. There are ways to increase the volumetric efficiency. Um, simple ways are... Uh, the intake tubes, the shorter they are and the straighter they are, the fewer bends, the better it's going to be. Um, you can do things like add a turbocharger or a, a, a blower, if you will, or supercharger. We'll talk about those later. Uh, but those are compressors that force the air. So instead of the plunger pulling back and letting the air get sucked in, now you've got a device that is blowing it in there. And so we can go with a turbocharger or some type of supercharger, we can actually go over 100% efficiency to where the pressure in the piston cylinder here is now greater than it is outside. So there's the two extremes, right? Um, so not everything has a turbocharger or a supercharger. I mean, they're becoming more and more common, but so you have to back it up a little bit and say, okay, what can we do to increase volumetric efficiency by design to get that up better than it is without adding a turbocharger, which adds weight and cost and complexity, or a supercharger, again, weight, complexity, uh, cost. Um, so there are things that can be done. And those things are 
valve overlap and valve timing. When you open and close these valves will change the volumetric efficiency of the engine. So, and that is valve overlap. So we'll talk about that. So valve overlap, let's see. Volumetric efficiency. Our VE, so I can save time and see the world, is how efficient a cylinder is at filling up to capacity while operating. I don't believe I wrote this in my notes anywhere, but one of the things that you hear about is port and polishing, where what a shop will do is they will take a cylinder and the intake port, they will actually grind it and polish it so it's super smooth so that there's no restriction to the air flowing. So if you look at the cylinders that we're using, the 290s, uh, those are pretty smooth, but you can feel some roughness in there. Now, there's an argument to and against it the argument for it is that you're going to polish the port. You're going to match all of the ports so they'll, on the same engine. So take the same, the cylinders that go on an engine, and they'll grind them and polish them till they all flow exactly the same. So have a very balanced engine, um, and so that would give you higher volumetric efficiency and better flow, more power. The argument against it, specifically for aircraft, is one. You've just ground away material in an item that is prone to cracking and has a, has a life limit to it. And two, maybe this is the manufacturer saying it, you know, because I have noticed that the manufacturer tends to say things that supports their product rather than saying we it's a pro, it's a it's a problem a, a bad design. It's as smooth as we can get. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, they'll just say no, no, no. That roughness causes the air to tumble as it goes through the system. That tumbling air mixed with the fuel helps the fuel and air mix really well for a better burn. So one side says that, the other side says, no, it doesn't. You just got to ball golf ball. Yeah, golf balling it. So anyway, uh, so volumetric efficiency, VE of a normally aspirated. And what does normally aspirated mean? Not turbocharged. Not, okay, not forced induction is a good way of saying it. it covers everything. You're not forcing the air into it. You're, the air is only coming in naturally by the piston coming down. Now, the, the neat thing about our aircraft engines is their installation almost always takes into consideration what we call ram air. The forward movement of the aircraft is forcing air into the induction systems, so it's somewhat of a forced induction that helps. So you put the single engine airplanes, especially, you're going to put the air cleaner and the, and the inlet right behind the propeller. So the propeller is forcing air in as well as the aircraft moving forward, at, you know, 100 plus miles an hour is also moving air in. So that helps. Um, so you have normally aspirated engine is always, always less than 100%. You just can't get to 100%. And I'm going to talk a lot about manifold pressure. And you kind of have to understand manifold pressure. And that is, so in an aircraft, let's say we have, we have our air cleaner. Then we have an air duct that's going to come in. And then we'll put the carburetor. So oops, the carburetor comes through the carburetor. And in the carburetor, we have a Venturi. It's a very simplified carburetor. And also we have a throttle plate. That's what controls the speed of the engine, right? When it's wide open and that's all the air gets through and then it sucks more fuel and the engine goes fast. Then when you go slow, it goes like that, it restricts the air movement. So you have that, and then it's gonna go off into the, the, the engine. There's the engine. Uh, our four cylinders. Okay, so manifold pressure is taken right here. 
manifold pressure. In your car and in an, an engine or aircraft equipped with a fixed pitch propeller, it's never a thought. It's just something that you could live your whole life without thinking about manifold pressure. As soon as you get into a constant speed propeller, it's a, it's a large function of your power. Um, so we talk, so I'll talk about manifold pressure. It's the pressure in this area right here. Now at idle, with this throttle plate closed, this engine has got four giant air pumps. And what are those air pumps doing? They are trying to pump air. They are sucking so hard against this valve right here that this area, this manifold pressure, is a very low, low pressure. It's a high vacuum uh, type environment. So we're going to see very low. We would say it, we say it's low manifold pressure. It can also be said it's a vacuum. In a car, it would be called a vacuum. We just don't call it that, but it, but it is a vacuum. And then at some point, as we open the throttle plate, we'll see that manifold pressure go up, 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 and up. And then we'll get to a point where, now you want to stay that way? We put the throttle plate is wide open. And let's just say our atmospheric pressure is, oh, you guys know you've had Phil. What is that normal atmospheric pressure? 29.92 on a standard day at sea level. We'll just call it 30 inches to make life easier. So best case scenario, my manifold pressure after it went through the induction system, across the venturi, through the throttle plate, the various turns it has to get, I'm probably going to be looking at 29 inches. So I'm going to lose one inch of manifold pressure, even best case scenario, just the pipes and air filter and everything else like that. So you have to consider the fact that we're, we're losing an inch anyway. So just kind of keep that in mind there. Um, so that's one of the reasons, I guess, why the volumetric efficiency is always less than 100%. Right off the bat, we're only going to give it 29 out of the 30 inches. I'm going to lose one inch of manifold pressure uh, right off the top there. So you have this problem. Um, volumetric efficiency is greatest at what? Idle or full throttle? Full, full throttle. Okay, I just told you that. So VE is greatest at wide open throttle. Also called WOT, wide open throttle. Why is it greatest at wide open throttle? No restrictions is exactly correct. Um, and so VE is less at idle, is worst. Yes, Stephen. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, manifold pressure can change uh, at different altitudes, correct? Oh, yeah, uh, of course. So if I started at sea level and have 30 outside, and at wide open throttle, I have 29. When I go up to altitude, and let's say I'm up high enough that now my atmospheric pressure outside is... 25 inches, what am I going to have for manifold? Best case, 24. So you're just going to lose an inch. All right, volumetric efficiency is worse at idle. Why is it worse at idle? Because you put in a big restriction with the throttle plate. Um, sharp bends um, reduce efficiency. Sharp. Sharp bends in intake system reduce efficiency. Um, high, oh, this is a good one. So high intake air temps uh, reduce efficiency. All carbureted aircraft have a carburetor heater on it because carburetors are prone to icing up. And they are really prone at, uh, at idle speeds. But... So you have a carburetor heater. One of the things that we check in a carbureted aircraft before we take off is we run the aircraft engine up to about 1,700 RPM. We do a mag check, and I reach over, and I grab the carburetor heater, and I pull it on. And there's a little flapper valve inside of a box located kind of in this area right here that has an alternate air coming in where it sucks air that has gone around the exhaust system. So it's not exhausted air, it's around the exhaust because the muffler is super hot. So it sucks air coming off of the uh, muffler and it would kind of look like this. So now this hot air rolls into here and goes in my engine. Well, I just increased the heat. So what happened? 
efficiency. Decrease efficiency. You will notice about 100 to 200 RPM drop that fast when you pull a carb heat on. All things being equal, just whoom, 200 RPM. And then you turn it back off, and then it closes the flapper valve. Flapper valve, that's ah, bad drawing. Closes this off, and then and cold air comes in through the, through the inlet. So instantly, instantly. It is something you need to know that if you did have carburetor ice, which is really prone, especially I had a, a Cessna 150, they're really prone because the carburetor hangs low. Um, oh, it does on my airplane too. Um, so at idle, you, I got carb ice. So how many times I ever got carb ice? I was sitting there idling with my daughter and it starts to run rough and it gets a little worse, get worse. You can see the RPM starting to drop and you're like, wow, this airplane's running like crap. And we're just idling on the ground. And so reach over, pull carb heat on, what's gonna happen? It'll smooth, oh, it's going to run real bad now. It's going to get way worse. And why did it get way worse? Because I opened up that valve, and now I'm inducing hot air plus ice. water. Because there was ice in there. So now I got hot air and water going in there. So it's going to get worse. Then it's going to get better. Then I'll close in the carb heat, and then it goes up to normal. So it starts getting worse, 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 running crappy, open the carb heat, crappier, then better, close carb heat, back to normal. So. All right, I guess that's it for today, huh? Yeah, just get